Good evening. You're watching the news today. We are live from the Jaffa port. It's Monday night. Tensions are rising between Israel and Hezbollah following yesterday's killing of Samir Kuntar, which the Lebanese militant group attributes to an IDF airstrike. Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah is set to make an address in half an hour, which we will bring to you live. After last night's exchange of fire along the Israel-Lebanon border, the question now is whether the situation will escalate. I-24 News defense correspondent Shai Benari reports. A funeral procession in Beirut's Dakhya quarter for a man who became a symbol of the Lebanese militant Hezbollah organization. The body of the terrorist Samir Kuntar was brought back to Lebanon following his death in Damascus Saturday in what Hezbollah officials are saying was an Israeli airstrike. If the Israelis think that by killing Samir Kantar they have closed an account, then they are very mistaken. Because they know and will come to know that they have instead opened several more that can't be easily closed. But while Israel has maintained a typical silence, others have in fact claimed credit. The operational battalion of the Damascus Regional Command, together with the Knights of the Horan Brigade, conducted the assassination of Samir Kuntar and his companions. And we deny the statement by Hezbollah that this was done by the Zionist Air Force. This was an attempt to make light of the Free Syrian Army's achievements. It is far from certain that Syrian rebels were indeed responsible, but the claim is indicative of Hezbollah's complex situation. Its involvement in the Syrian civil war, in which according to Israeli estimates it is thought to have lost over 1,300 fighters, means the militant group has no shortage of enemies. Samir Kuntar joined Hezbollah in 2008 after it managed to release him and others from Israeli imprisonment in exchange for the bodies of two dead IDF soldiers. In the past few months, Kuntar had set up the Jaramana district of Damascus as his base while he worked on organizing attacks against Israel on the Golan Heights. For this, he used his contacts with the Syrian Druze community, many of whom live near the border with Israel. While he was still perceived as a senior figure in Hezbollah, there are indications he had become increasingly independent and that his bosses in Beirut and Tehran did not support his efforts to strike at Israel, as both Hezbollah and Iran currently have their hands full with other concerns. Hezbollah faces a major dilemma over what will constitute its response to the death of Qantar, with the organization's secretary general, Hassan Nasrallah, scheduled to hold a speech Monday evening. Three rockets were fired into Israeli territory Sunday, but Hezbollah has notably not claimed responsibility for those launches. Last January, the group fired an anti-tank missile at an IDF border patrol, killing two Israeli soldiers in response to an Israeli strike in Syrian territory, which killed a high-ranking Hezbollah commander as well as Iranian officers. Many are wondering how much Hezbollah is willing to gamble as it mulls a response to the latest developments. Yes, and for tonight's opening debate on the tension on the Lebanon-Israel border, I'm joined in studio by Itzhak Lebanon, former Israeli ambassador to Egypt. Good evening. Good evening, and thank you for having me. Thank you for being with us. And our defense correspondent, Shai Benari. Good evening, Shai. Good evening, Ayman. Well, Mr. Lebanon, the Lebanon-Israel border has consistently been a flashpoint, with Hezbollah always casting a shadow of a threat over Israel throughout the years. Last night's killing of Samir Kuntar, how much of a blow is it to Hezbollah? Well, first of all, it has been a latent, let's say, tension between us and Lebanon. It was not something active. Secondly, what happened yesterday, it was, uh, you know, a spot from one side in the Lebanese side into an Israeli side. It was not along the border, which is a, a relatively a long border. Uh, to answer your question, look, in my mind, Samir Kuntar, he was just a terrorist. He did nothing, basically, less than the attack that when he was 16 or 17 years old. All his life he spent in prison. I don't believe that for that, and if the, even, you know, he was released by Hezbollah, that Hezbollah will launch or will open a war with Israel, knowing the consequences for Hezbollah, only for the sake of Samir Kuntar. So you don't believe that even despite Hezbollah assigned him to open a new front in the Golan Heights against Israel, that they're not very likely to respond to his Look, killing? Look, I, I think that, that Hezbollah and probably also the Syrian army, they do understand that Israel will not allow it for, for many reasons basically for security reasons, and we'll not do it. I mean, if there will be a need that we will react once, twice, or three times, and five times, and 100 times, we will do that. So they, they do understand.
The fact that Samir Kuntar wanted you know, to establish this so-called front in the Golan Heights is well known by the Israelis, and, and this is why he was preparing also a huge attack in the Golan Heights. And this was the main reason why, you know, it was decided uh, by whom who did it. Uh, I'm not saying that Israel did it, but somebody did it in any case. With the, with the elimination of Samir Kantar, I think that the most important thing is the intelligence, the information, to know where he is in Germana, uh, which is a neighborhood in Damascus where the Christians and the Druze live together, knowing where, where he lives and to hit, you know, in his home and place where it is, look, this is a very sensitive and high degree of gathering, you know, information. If I were Hezbollah or the Syrian army or even the Iranians, I would be very, very worried. Well, let's continue with this point about gathering intelligence, Shai. We expect that Samir Kuntar was closely monitored by Israeli <laughs> intelligence. To what degree is this also true for Hezbollah in general? Because in the past, Hezbollah was very well, well guarded in terms of intelligence. Has the situation changed over the last few years? Uh, Hezbollah poses a, a very serious threat, and it is a different one from the one it posed a few years ago. Hezbollah has undergone some sort of involvement, you could say, uh, following its or during its uh, involvement in the Syrian civil war. We're talking about something that is really changing into more a uh, more standard sort of ground army, as opposed to uh, guerrilla tactics that it would rely on very heavily in the past. Today, we are seeing uh, they are paying a price. Hezbollah. In terms of the body count, there are uh, thought to be over a thousand casualties for Hezbollah alone in the Syrian civil war. But it also comes with certain gains that it is making in terms of very valuable battle experience and very serious capabilities that they are gaining. And, and the Israelis are worried about it. But uh, uh, there is so long as the Syrian civil war uh, continues, I don't see, and I think a lot of people would agree with me on this point, uh, a Hezbollah interest in actually opening a, a separate, a parallel conflict with Israel. Their capabilities still wouldn't be able to allow that. The question is, what happens when the Syrian uh, conflict comes to a close, which is a very uh, realistic scenario in 2016 that a fighting could cease there. What happens then after Hezbollah pulls back its forces, now that it has this new battlefield experience? And, and we're talking about very, uh, we're talking about an army uh, comparable, at least in terms of tactics and, and certain capabilities, to the IDF itself. We're talking about a more, uh, uh, perhaps a shift back to a more conventional type of warfare that a lot of people thought was maybe a thing of the past. Well, as we know, last night, uh, three rockets were fired into northern Israel, and we want to check the situation there now. We are joined live from Naharia by Mohammed Lakasem, I-24 News correspondent and analyst. Mohammed, good evening. Thank you for being with us. Good evening, uh, Ayman. Uh... Yes, Mohammed, it's only been 24 hours since those three rockets were fired into northern Israel. Can you tell us what the status on the ground in Naharia, where you are, is like tonight? Well, the status here uh, is very quiet. Uh, life is normal. We've been here for a couple of hours. Uh, people are going up, you know, uh, about uh, their own business, uh, out to dinner, walking around. Uh, life is normal, unlike what happened, you know, uh, just 24 hours uh, from now uh, when three uh, rockets uh, landed here in uh, the northern part of Israel, close to the Lebanese borders. Uh, things are quiet, uh, and people don't seem to be, uh, you know, uh, feeling that uh, anything uh, uh, Serious may uh, may happen. And uh, I want to get back to you, Mr. Lebanon. We know that uh, uh, Hezbollah has threatened a reaction. Uh, you say that this is unlikely. They have done this in the past, even though abroad. Is this a likely uh, scenario that will happen? Look, I don't know what Hezbollah will do, but definitely he will have to react, probably in a way, in my mind, uh, that will not, let's say, generate a uh, escalation between him and Israel because he is not interested in opening a war with Israel. Secondly, I, I fully agree, you know, with Shai, those people, you know, of Hezbollah fighting in Syria, they are accumulating, you know, a lot of experience. But in fact, those soldiers, they are morally defeated. They do not succeed, let's say, they thought when they came to Syria that they will take, you know, in, 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 in four or five weeks, the Kalamun Mountain. They are still unable to do that. And in front of whom? in front of their resistance, which doesn't have weapons, etc. So morally, this is a defeated soldier. Now, to face the huge military machine of Israel, I think that Nasrallah and Hezbollah, they are not interested. But somehow, they will do some reaction, which will not escalate, let's say, the situation between us and Hezbollah. This is more or less what I see uh, that Nasrallah will do. 
beside, you know, the diatribes, you know, and the wording in his speech tonight, uh, that we are going to do, we are not going to forget, you know, this is, um, uh, the, 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 the book is open and we are writing everything and Israel will listen. And if you think that, Israel, that we are going to, to, to forget, you know, Israel is making a mistake, you know, this is uh, a rhetoric that we are used to. But basically, I think that Hezbollah is not interested in opening a full front a war with Israel because he knows the consequences. Well, we'll just mention that uh, when uh, Jihad Mournia was killed uh, in January this He's year, it took... more important than Samia Kunta. Yes, at that time, it took uh, the uh, Hezbollah two weeks to respond. We will have you back here, gentlemen, hopefully f with good news, not bad news, to keep okay. on following the story for us. Okay. Ho and it's hopefully not. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Hayman. And now, the Israeli military, in conjunction with the U.S. Pentagon, has completed the last phase of trials for the David Sling air defense system and is expected to take possession of it in the first quarter of 2016. The trials occurred in recent days in southern Israel and were led by Rafael Advanced Defense Systems together with the U.S. defense company Raytheon. David Sling can intercept short-range to medium-range rockets and ballistic missiles, including guided projectiles. Its range of coverage allows it to destroy incoming threats over enemy territory away from Israeli skies.